In this video tutorial, we're going to show some steps on how to troubleshoot reinforcement that is required um, near walls for design strips near walls. And in this particular case, we have a two-way flat slab that's post-tensioned. And we have quite a bit of reinforcement, um, both top and bottom reinforcement near this wall, uh, which may seem um, a little bit strange um, in terms of an output. So we want to kind of drill down and look and see how we can take an approach uh, in uh, determining how this rebar is being calculated. So the first thing we'll do is we'll note how the design strips have been laid out in this particular example. We basically have splitters that bound off the wall on the top and the bottom so that the design cut does not extend over the wall. If the design cut extends over the wall, then the design sections are not designed for strength reinforcement. So the user in this case has input splitters. I'll go ahead and turn those on. And these splitters allow uh, the user to gather reinforcement relative to both minimum requirements and strength requirements near the wall. And we've done this on both sides. We have a strip on the top. I'll refer to that as the top strip and a strip on the bottom referred to as the bottom strip. So we're going to go through and determine how uh, this reinforcement is being calculated. We'll focus mainly on the top reinforcement. A similar approach could apply to bottom reinforcement. So um, we'll go ahead and set our default display. Another thing to note before we analyze and design those strips is the presence or lack thereof uh, for base reinforcement. If we go to the, the rebar toolbar or ribbon, we'll go to display manager and I'll turn on the calculated and base reinforcement. There's no discrete reinforcement um, or uniform reinforcement. We also need to check to see if there's any mesh reinforcement. So we'll go to visibility, view settings, and we want to turn on the mesh reinforcement symbols. There is mesh reinforcement. So there's top and bottom reinforcement. Um, and the distribution here is 5 at 24, top and bottom, both ways. Okay, so there's plenty of um, mesh reinforcement tendons. We can also note there are banded tendons in this case that belong to the top strip and the bottom strip. And the number of tendons is 7. These are half inch diameter unbonded cables. The lower strip also has seven. We'll go now to analysis and we're going to execute the analysis for um, service combinations which would lead to the minimum reinforcement requirement and then also for strength combinations. Uh, there's a variety of different combos here that belong to different analysis option types. So we'll select all of the combos and we're going to then run the analysis. We'll select yes to save the results and we're now going to select floor design. We'll generate the strips. This had already been done previous but just to show the entirety of the solution here we'll generate those strips. I'll navigate to the X direction strips and I'm going to just select the um, the top strip and bottom strip that we're focusing on here for this result. If you select um, individual strips in this way or a group of strips, we can design only those strips. We'll design the section cuts for the top and bottom locations. Okay, we'll save that. I'll go back to the tendons, turn the tendons off for a moment, and we're going to um, just generate the reinforcement for the envelope for both service and strength conditions here. We'll go back to um, floor design. I'll calculate the rebar plan. And we're going to select envelope to start. And we can see we have quite a bit of reinforcement um, in the two locations. Now if I go into this setting here, 8 number 5's top. Here we have 10 number 5's top. This actually belongs to the upper strip. This belongs to the lower strip. If I select um, three number fives here, you can see that belongs to the lower strip. And then uh, we have an additional three number fives, which also belongs to the lower strip. So 
we're looking mainly at the um, at the eight and the ten number five bars uh, here uh, shown at the top design strip. Um, the first thing we want to do is we want to determine from which combinations uh, do these bars come from? What's producing this required amount of reinforcement? So the quickest way to achieve that is if we go back and we envelope both surface and strength individually. I'll envelope now the strength to start. We can see that there's actually no reinforcement required in addition to the base rebar and the post-tensioning cables um, for meeting the demand or the ultimate limit state for the different design cuts. So that tells us that the rebar really comes from the envelope of service. If we go back, we change this to service, we can see um, that this is produced for service requirements. We can also select any design cut under the design section tab. We can see exactly which design cut is producing the amount of rebar. So, for example, this produces 2.8 uh, square inches of steel. That's just slightly over nine bars, so that rounds up to ten. Um, if I go to the next design cut, again, there's 2.8 here, 2.8. So this is all fairly consistent with the number of bars needed for sections one, two, three, and we'll check a fourth section here. Again, that's 2.8, and then we get into a position where it goes back to zero. So we have a location that's centered around this node along the support line. That's important to note. We have a node there which acts almost as a virtual support. Okay, And we have two sections to the left and two sections to the right that we have this requirement of 2.8 square inches of steel. Um, so what we want to do is we want to drill down a little further and determine how the program is actually calculating these bars and why it's calculating it at this location. This uh, node along the support line is considered again a support and if we go into the uh, envelope of service combinations and we go into under the analysis um, option in the result browser we're going to turn on the envelope of bending actions along the strip. And we can see for these four locations, one, two, uh, excuse me, one, two, three, and four, the maximum bending action there is negative moments. So if I turn on the values, we can see those values. We have negative 20, 29, 27, 26, and 13. The minimum values are eight, negative two, negative one, and then we have some very small value here that's actually positive bending there. So these maximum values, um, maximum negative moments rather, are producing the reinforcement necessary for the top of the support in this case. Now going back into the design cut, each design cut is given a particular uh, criteria. So these are two-way slab design sections. That's identified as the design of the strip. This is a two-way slab. And because there's post-tensioning intersecting the cut, this gets designed as a two-way PT slab. And it's being designed per ACI 318. So for support locations of two-way PT slabs, we have to meet this prescriptive amount of reinforcement point uh, zero 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 seven five times the area in either orthogonal direction. The first orthogonal cut is this cut that's perpendicular to the support line. So if we take this cut, for example, we have a length of 102 inches, a height of 14 inches, and we can produce an area of steel based on the expression from ACI 318 that would uh, give us one value uh, for that particular uh, provision in the code. We also have to produce um, programmatically the, a, a way to evaluate the orthogonal direction without evaluating that strip in the y direction. One reason for this is if you have a symmetrical slab and you have only strips in one direction, we also check some virtual cut in the opposite direction based on the location of support line nodes. So this virtual um, orthogonal design cut is based on the distance from this support node 
to the adjacent support node to the left, and that's somewhere off screen over here, and also to the right. And what we're doing is we're taking one half the length, we'll call this first length L1 to the left, and the second length L2 to the right, and using those lengths to create a virtual cut. If the, uh, if the node to the left or right is the last node in sequence, then we actually assume it's a cantilever for purposes of the calculation, and we use the full length. So we'll go ahead and look at those nodes. We have this node, which is the, the quote-unquote support node that we're looking at that's really producing this reinforcement. The other node is here. There's my second node, or my node to the left. And you can see this is not the last in sequence. There's an additional node over here at the start point. So we're using half the length between, I'll mark this, this is node 1 and node 2. We're taking one half the distance there. And if I move over to the right, we have a node way over here. And that is the last node in sequence. So here we're actually taking the full length L2 between node 2 and node 3. We take those uh, distances and multiply them by the slab thickness, and that generates this orthogonal virtualized section that we use to evaluate the minimum reinforcement. So in this case, the rebar is actually coming from that virtual section. That, that is greater in terms of area than the actual section perpendicular to the support line. Here the area is 1,420 square inches. Um, if we actually take a look at the lengths that we're working with, I'll go ahead and use the option to generate dimensions. So here we have 26.94 and 38.46. So that the total length we look at in this uh, condition is about 52 feet. And if we multiply that by 12 and multiply by the thickness, we get an area of roughly 8,700 um, square inches. Now, if we multiply that out by the requirement, we actually need 6.54 square inches of minimum reinforcement in the top location of that design cut. Keep in mind that we do have base reinforcement, so we really only need the net balance once we consider the base reinforcement. Now, in reality, this is a continuous wall, and the provision that the program is applying to support lines based on the criteria um, is somewhat rigid in terms of uh, its imposition on the design nodes or the support line nodes. So the best way around this, this in other words, this reinforcement is really not required in this particular case if we assume, okay, this is a, a continuous support the provision of the code might be interpreted as column supports or end of wall support locations not in the field of the wall along the path of the support line. So the, the best way to, to um, lay out the support line in this case is really just to create multiple nodes. I would take this wall and I might break this into nodes such that the spacing between nodes is less than or equal to the, the maximum design cut along the strip. If I take this design cut here, this is the maximum design cut. The length is 127 inches, so we'll say it's 10 feet. We want to space nodes along this um, path no more than 10 feet. And so what I'll do is I'll go ahead, I'm going to go back to floor design. I will delete out my design cuts, and I'll select this uh, support line. I'll right click. I'm just going to insert more vertices and we'll go ahead and just insert these. I'm Here I'm just basically eyeballing the spacing. I'm not really spacing them at 10 feet exactly. So we'll take a, a few and create those. And then once I go back and generate my design cuts, we have multiple nodes, right? Multiple virtual supports. But in this case, the distance between two adjacent nodes is always less than the actual design cut distance, and in, and we we should not obtain you know reinforcement in the location that we had previously. So if I come back and I just design this strip, we should see no reinforcement located at some uh, location along the 
uh, wall path. Okay, so that's been redesigned for that top uh, strip. I'll go back now and generate my reinforcement for the envelope. And you can see we have a few bars out here where we were not really paying much attention to. We have one bar over here, which um, is at the end of the wall, another bar here where we have this intersection. So there's no additional rebar required in this location for service or minimum requirements based on how the support line points are laid out. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact support at adaptsoft.com. Thank you.